Good morning and welcome to Slate School and the first of our series of panel discussions entitled Imagining the Future of Education. Slate School is committed to excellence in education and we are delighted to present the Education Idea Lab, which is a new and unique virtual series that is free and open to the public. This thought leading event convenes leaders, change makers, and participants from all sectors of education and innovation. Thank you so much for joining us. We are absolutely thrilled to have you all here with us today. My name is Julie Mountcastle, and I am head of school at Slate School. So I'll briefly introduce you to Slate School, review the panel logistics, and then we'll hear from our four expert panelists. So Slate School is an independent 501c3 nonprofit elementary school where education is focused on cultivating creativity, fostering ingenuity, and inspiring a deep passion for lifelong learning. At Slate School, we have formed a community that is constantly striving to improve practice, to create meaningful educational experience for learners of all ages, and to change the landscape in education. Slate School convenes experts for important, authentic conversations about education and these online dialogues, just like today's, are all free and open to the public. We are so delighted to have you with us today. And I believe, again, we have learners joining us from six continents. So um, we do not imagine that we will be able to come to comfortable conclusions about the future of education in one conversation today. Our hope, rather, is to convene more panels around these same questions throughout the summer. We can all press this conversation further by sharing our best thoughts about this complicated and completely worthwhile topic. So I will first describe the basic logistics of the panel. We have four amazing panelists and they have a wealth of expertise to share with you during this hour. Um, and we'll begin with each of our panelists today giving just about a two minute introduction about themselves, their current role, and their initial thoughts about our topic, imagining the future of education. And we'll then proceed to the panel discussion. And we invite you to submit additional questions as comments on Facebook. And we will select some of those questions to ask the panelists today too. So please send those in. Um, so we'll proceed with having our panelists introduce themselves in alphabetical order. I'm delighted to introduce you to our first panelist, Eric Davis. Good morning, Eric. Hey, thanks, Julie. Thanks everybody for the panel and for being here and doing this. Um, quick shout out to you and Slate School. I think this, what you're doing in convening these conversations is awesome. And I really appreciate the different topics you've tackled. So um, yeah, for sure. And uh, thanks for inviting me to participate. I appreciate it. Um, I'm a career educator. Um, I've done just about every role over the last 20 some years. Uh, teacher, coach, counselor, started schools, ran schools, uh, executive director, I built a licensing company that licensed inquiry and project-based curriculum nationally. Um, I've shifted much more to the professional development side of things, both uh, education and ed tech companies. So building out implementation and learning teams and looking at scale much more profoundly in the last five to seven years than um, the kind of focus on one school, one location, one community. Um, and the question that we're kind of thinking about today is something I think I've thought about for a long time. Um, now feeling very much um, this balance of like things that we know work with connecting human beings and engaging people so that they can move toward their aspirational goals and so that they can have a chance to connect and have a relevant learning experience. Um, but also where, where there are opportunities to do things a little bit differently than they might have been done. Um, selfishly, I look at this and I think like we built an inquiry and project-based school with digital curriculum more than 10 years ago. And, you know, being in a moment now where people are clamoring for something that we had done a while ago when we were too far ahead of the curve then, fascinating to just be in this whirlwind. And in a way, that's kind of what it feels like. It's all of these swirling ideas and trying to identify the ones that you can grab out that are really going to work and grow. So looking forward to chatting with the four or five of you. Fantastic. Thanks, Eric. And our next panelist is Jillian Judson. Good morning, Jillian. Good morning. It is such a pleasure to be here, bright and early. Um, I'm coming to you from Canada. 
I live on the unceded territory of the Kwatlen, Kaitsi, and Semiamu First Nations people, otherwise known as Surrey, outside of Vancouver. And I'm an assessment, assistant professor at Simon Fraser University, and I'm the executive director of CIRCE, which stands for the Centre for Imagination in Research, Culture, and Education. Now, doesn't that sound fun? <laughs> I know. Um, so my work, my research, my teaching, um, my curiosity, it always has been around the role of imagination in our intellectual development, in our learning, in our loving, in our living, and in leadership as well. So um, I've been thinking a lot about, during my doctoral studies and, and past, just how we can bring imagination and the growth of imagination to the center of schools and practices. because. It's really interesting. We tend to um, associate imagination with the fantasy life of the young child or maybe those great artists and we don't remember that all those times we make a call for creativity. We want to be innovative. The, the big catch words in business and school is creativity and innovation and transformation but that all starts with the what if of imagination and we could do a much better job of growing the capacity to imagine what is possible. So that's what I'm hoping to talk a little bit more about today. And I'm also really looking forward to sitting back, drinking my tea, because it's only 8.07, and <laughs> listening to all of you. So thanks for having me. Fantastic, thanks, thanks for that, that's great. Um, our next panelist is Grant Lichtman. Morning, Grant. Uh, good morning, and thanks so much for having me uh, coming to you also from the West Coast, from just north of San Diego, California, and I think I want to go work for Jillian. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, uh, after a career in the for-profit world, I worked at a large independent school as a senior administrator for about 15 years, uh, and then in 2012, uh, got in my Prius and drove around the country for 89 days and I visited 65 schools asking some of the questions that Jillian was asking, which is what does this word innovation actually mean and how are we preparing our students better for the future than we have in the past? And that became a book, Ed Journey. And I've sort of been on that journey ever since, though I don't travel around in my Prius as much anymore. I tend to travel in airplanes. And I'm the lucky guy who gets to visit a lot of schools, work with a lot of schools of all different types, uh, public, private, and charter schools and districts uh, in the United States, in Canada, and, and to some extent around the world. And I guess uh, my work has really been driven by, and, and three books now in five and a half years, have been driven by a couple of different uh, over, o overarching questions. The, the, the first one, the overarching drivers, the first one is uh, the world is changing at a rapid pace and education hasn't been. And if any of us thought the world wasn't changing at a rapid pace, uh, many of us were dissuaded of that 12 weeks ago. And for those who still didn't think the world was changing at a rapid pace, I think we've been dissuaded of that over the last 10 days or two, or two weeks. Uh, very thankfully. <clears throat> and so uh, the question of how are, how are schools going to respond to that different paradigm where we have to be much more dy dynamic than static as we have in the past. And then the other driver has been, I, I think that uh, education is faced with three existential questions. Why should we change? What's that change going to look like? And how do we get there? Uh, the first question, why should we change as far as I'm concerned, is so far in our rearview mirror go for many holders around the country around the world uh, and we need to change because of the rate of change in the world uh, what that's going to look like I think is a lot of the conversation that Julie wants us to engage in I actually think that we uh, are having a uh, we arrived at a uh, great understanding collective understanding about what a lot of those changes are looking like a much more centric inquiry based thematic based project based maybe even play based uh, kind of education system and i've been focusing therefore more on how do we actually change school systems and engage communities to school from where they uh oh yeah Boy, just when he was getting hot. That well, was... Julie, I better be careful and not go on too long or I know I'll get cut off. <laughs> exactly. That's it. I think I think the ideas around inquiry, they just explode the system. I mean, they just <laughs> blow everything up. I think, you're right. I think Facebook uh, can't handle it. 
Thank right, you. We just can't Matt handle it. Matt Lichtman. Um, I'm sure we're going to get him back. I was just typing to say, we're having a little trouble hearing you. Um, but I'm sure we'll get Grant back shortly. Uh, but let's go on and, and, and meet Wendy Ostroff. Uh, Wendy, how are you? Hi, I'm doing well. I'm so excited to be here and be with this wonderful group. It's a great honor to join you. And um, I'm a developmental psychologist, trained as a developmental psychologist. I'm also a professor in an inter kind of interdisciplinary and innovative program called the Hutchins School of Liberal Studies in, um, at Sonoma State University. So what we do there, we, we started in the 1960s, and what we do is we flatten the hierarchy between teachers and learners, professors and students, and we teach um, using dialogue. All our courses are, are seminar-based. The students bring the topics up just as much as the professors. They design courses, they design um, areas of, of inquiry, and we approach this as learners together. We teach courses that are outside of our discipline by design. And so we're just engaging together in meaning making and, and forming knowledge. Most of my students are gonna go on to be elementary teachers. And so it's this kind of wonderful opportunity to grow together as thinkers and, and learners and um, communicators. And so it's kind of this, this little nesting place to go into the world of, of teaching and learning as, as an inquiry based model. And I'm also, have uh, do some research and have written some books about curiosity and about bringing the science of child development onto the ground. So really a lot of curating of some of the science of how we learn. And I'd say if I had to describe my work overall, it's about learning. It's just understanding how people learn from infants and children to grown-ups and all of us. And I love your idea, Jillian, about play. You know, we're all playing. We're all doing intellectual playfulness all the time. And so when I think of the future of education, I really, I really think that we need to approach a less fear-based model, less based on um, you know, imposing or one size fits all or, or checking boxes or delivering curriculum and, and more on the process and just, just a learner-based model with more freedom and more trust that learning is gonna happen, that we're born to learn, that we're incredibly good at it, especially kids and that teachers and learners are really the same, that we're, we're the same, we're joining in this process together. So I would love to see uh, us approaching things with loosening, not, not tightening what we're doing um, in education. Awesome. So Grant, we lost you about halfway through your, your, your beautiful talk <clears throat> there. And so I, I, wanna, I wanna just go back to you and give you a chance to kind of feather back into what you, were, what you were sharing with us about your hopes for today. Well, I, I don't know where, where you lost me, so I'll try to jump in right just at the end. Uh, again, I, I think that education is facing sort of three existential questions. Why should we change? What that change is going to look like? And how do we get there? And the why should be well in our rear view mirror. I think the what education looks like, what, what Wendy was just talking about, uh, I, I think there's a lot of more convergence than there was even a decade or maybe even a half a decade ago, uh, where... Uh, a, a decade ago, if you start talking about student-centric and personalized learning and, you know, really uh, interdisciplinary learning, thematic project-based, there are a lot of people who gave you a blank stare at that. Those blank stares have disappeared in a lot of places. So there's a lot more agreement about what good student-centric inquiry-based looking looks like for the future. I think the real question that people are struggling with is, how do we get there? How do I change my practice in my classroom? How do I how do we as a school change? How do we as a district change? How do we as a, as a community change? And so that's kind of where a lot of my work is focused right now. Awesome. I, you know, I, so I want to begin because I think what I think what we're all kind of saying here is, is you know, we recognize that where we are is not where we want to be. And, and probably that's good for always in life, no matter what subject you're talking about. We can always be better at everything. Um, but I love the fact that before we signed on today, Jillian said, this is going to be fun. This is going to be, this is adult play. You know, we're all thinkers and educators and we're, we're, we're going to play with this, these, these important ideas and we're going to think about them. And I, I love that. And I think that um, over the last three and a half months, uh, maybe people are more open to learner centered education than they were even, you know, a year ago. Because I think that what's happened over the last three and a half months is that um, it has become learner centered because the, the programs that are offering, you know, 80 worksheets a week, um, I think families recognize that is not 
that's not real sustenance. That's not real food for the brain or for the soul. And so I think um, there might be there might be an opportunity here. And so I, I'm wondering if we could, if, if everybody on the panel could really just talk a little bit about what you think these unexpected benefits might be from the way that we've responded to this unthinkable challenge. Anybody got any thoughts on that? I saw you nodding before, Eric. What do you think? I did, and then I just didn't want to jump in, but I had a couple immediately. Come on. I, I like that you're optimistic in your response, but I'm not there with you yet. I think what's happened is you have a, you know, you think about like, um, you know, crossing the chasm, that concept in sales and the idea of like you have your early adopters you get across and your pragmatists are really slow to cross the chasm. And what happened is they didn't cross the chasm, the chasm moved. There was an earthquake underfoot and they found themselves on the other side of the chasm. And that doesn't make them suddenly capable of facilitating imagination or creative play or self-directed learning, but rather it finds themselves trying to grasp whichever tool is most accessible to them today to be able to finish the 2019-2020 school year. Now, as they move into the 2020-21 school year and beyond, I think we get much more beautiful, potentially life-altering questions about how does self-directed learning happen? How do we empower students to want to and know how to move through their learning, whether it's at home or at school or in a hybrid model? I don't think we're there. And I think what's actually happened is that the, the gap between those who have and have not has in, accelerated tenfold, if not more, I look at my kids who wake up every day in an environment where they are expected to wake and play and engage the world. And if I'm not there, well, the rocks and dirt and worms are. And if I'm not there, well, there's food that's in a cabinet at their height that they can pull out and get and take. Um, and so there's a whole self-directed approach in my house. I am spoiled rotten. My kids are the most privileged and they have all of that. But I think about the massive kids who are suffering from all sorts of issues right now who are getting the antithesis of that. And they may not be getting a worksheet, but I excel in con, that's no better when that's the only thing you do. So I'll pause now. I get what you're saying. I, I think I, I can see other people want to chime in. I want to say too that what I'm hoping is that th the realization of of hunger for that thing that we understand that we need something different is important and i don't think that that's been as universal as it is jillian i just want to jump in because one of the questions you gave us first which we may not get to and that's totally fine that's wonderful was you know why do we continue to have these problems you know convincing dealing with those blank stares that was just brought up the idea that we'll, we'll do it this way and like what are you talking about and in your questions you said how do we deal with that i think we have to go back i think we have to realize that when we have educational conversations we're thinking with ideas that we've been trained to think with about education so in one room at one time or across an internet virtual space sir people are thinking basically different views of the purpose of education. And so if the purpose of education is to create a peaceful society and support kids in getting getting jobs, and we might call that a socializing purpose, then that detracts from the purpose person that says, well, no, we need to develop the minds through geometry and physics and without that doesn't have direct uh, social purpose or the people that are saying, we need to let the child choose. We need to like the Rousseauian beliefs, but whether we name the theorists or not, we try to do all three in a school. Mm -hmm. And when you, the more time you spend on one, you detract from the other. Kieran Egan, he's an, um, the original developer of imaginative education as an approach. He talks about how as long as we're trying to fulfill any one, as long as we let any one of those purposes drive our curricular decisions, we are detracting from the ability to do the other things. Now, I'm not offering any solution. I'm just offering the blank stare. I'm offering the why we, because if, if you're arguing we need to do this because it's what school is for, but I'm arguing we need to do this because school is for this, we have a problem. If we had more time, I would say instead we should pick up a different idea and it has to do with developing the capacity to imagine the world, etc. And in doing so, we can fulfill a lot of different aims. But we aren't often aware of the ideas that we're thinking with in education. We all come to school with experiences of what it's supposed to be for, what we enjoyed, what we didn't enjoy. And so then the complicated conversations we have with our colleagues 
can be frustrating because we just don't understand how we can see the world so differently. And there are also gaps for possibility and change within that. But the blank stare, I don't know if we'll ever get rid of that in education. I hope we do. <laughs> But it's a good thing. I mean, I'm, I, I don't think it's a bad thing. I don't want it to get, I don't think education should ever get stale. We always need to have these creative spaces where we can reimagine what's going on, right? The We're never, it's no good. Yes. Diversity is what we want. We yeah. don't want everybody to have the same idea. Yes. Agree. Wendy. So one of the, one of the um, beautiful gifts of this trauma and tragedy and, and intensity we've just gone through is we've had this gift of time. So to this idea that, that things can come out, imagine the situation, you know, if you're not there, Eric saying, you know, the worms are and dirt are there. That's something that I really witnessed in coronavirus as a, as a silver lining is that, is that whatever way it happened, whether it was online for a few hours, whether it was worksheets, whatever it happened, it, it happened and got pushed aside. And then we had kids with a lot of time on their hands and not a lot of scheduled up, you know, all the activities were done. And I saw this incredible first boredom, which I think is super important for kids to experience. I feel like that should be part of our mission statement is you get bored and you go there. And it's something that I do a lot with my higher ed students in, in seminar, we sit in awkward pause and, and we do blank stare <laughs> and we sit and we actually think and we let some nonlinear things happen and we feel really weird and uncomfortable and, you know, and then we go somewhere pretty interesting and unpredicted. And I saw that happen, you know, with, with my own kids and a lot of uh, colleagues and a lot of um, parents that I spoke to is saying, yeah, actually they watched, they watched all the shows and then they got bored with the shows. And then you know what they did? They started playing things they hadn't played for three, four, five years. They started playing with their sibling in a way they hadn't played since they were in preschool. They started inventing games that came out of nowhere that they that they went into for hours and hours they had they had to fill their days and it's for many of these kids the very first time because they've been so managed this generation it's the very first time that they had unstructured time the kind of time we had you know in, in past generations so this these amazing imaginative things and discomfort it all happened with with childhood so i, I feel like wow look what look what kids can do if we can back off a little, because we had to in this case, because we had to work too, right? And so it was like, figure it out. And they did, they figured it out. So again, like our kids are teaching us so much here. I, 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 I'm, in one of the questions I, I, I posed for the panel originally, it, it uses the phrase wallowing in the complexity. Mm -hmm. And um, I, it was my, my oldest daughter that, that said, told me that that was important. You know, she taught me that from who she is, but she also identified it. She could speak about it. And she, you know, you've got to wallow in the complexity, mom. You know, <laughs> it's okay you don't have the answer. You've got to wallow in the complexity. That's what's really important because you're not gonna, you're not gonna find an answer. And that's okay too, you know? So uh, I guess, I, I guess this is a, you know, a, a way to kind of shift to you a little bit, Grant, because I'm wondering how we, how we model this for people in a way and for our students yeah. in a way that, um, that doesn't make them worried that we don't know where we're headed, but gives them confidence that we're always looking, that we're so constantly gonna, searching and thinking. So I'm gonna take a real risk here, which is modeling, uh, with two professors on the line, uh, a professor of education on the line, and say that uh, I think what's been going on over the last 20 years and what has been dramatically amplified in the last uh, 10 or 12 weeks is that we are remembering, uh, we're remembering John Dewey and Maria Montessori. Uh, everything that, uh, that I've found in, ed in education that people call innovative or deeper learning or 21st century skills, all that kind of stuff. The, the, the giants of the progressive era taught us all that 115 years ago, and then we forgot it and we lost our way. And over the last couple of decades, uh, some have been refining that way. Everything that these wonderful educators or knowledgeable educators are talking about, I, I think at a, at a very mundane level, because I don't have that background and training. To me, Dewey taught us that ex, uh, an experience leads to engagement, leads to passion, leads to learning. And it's a pretty simple equation. Um, and 
we found new ways to create those experiences or allow students to create those experiences uh, recently. So I, uh, I, I want to say that. I want to say that one of the things that we, uh, I, I agree with Eric, there's, there's sort of this uh, idea that somehow things are, all, you know, because of the pandemic, school's going to transform all of a sudden. It's not going to happen. That, that's just not, I think that's overly optimistic. Uh, one of the things that's one of the things that has happened is there's been an absolute explosion, and this leads to uh, I think your question. It's been an absolute explosion of connectivity. Radical connectivity is a key element of innovation across any system, and the cork went out of the bottle within a week after the pandemic shutdown started hitting, leading to the sort of event you're hosting right here, Julie. Uh, I had started uh, writing an, uh, about what I had called the cognitosphere about eight or, eight or nine years ago, others called the metaverse. We are now uh, experiencing the evolution of a global social neural network that allows all of us to exchange multilaterally, share information, flow knowledge, flow wisdom without anybody telling us what to do, empowering us to do it, giving us permission to do it. And it's, it, the, the cork absolutely came out of the bottle. If we can manage to not put that cork back in the bottle, we have a chance to transform education because we know a couple things about how organizations change. Number one, as, as Wendy was saying, we have to have some shared language. We have to have a shared North Star, a shared ethos. I visited one of the poorest, uh, one of the high schools in the poorest zip code in America, which is the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. And I visited and worked with some of the hoity-toityest blue blood boarding schools in New England, up in your neck of the woods, Julie. And those schools do not have the same needs. Their communities do not have the same needs. The outcomes are not the same. There is no one cookbook recipe. So engaging those communities, those communities figuring out what their North Star is, and then building towards that across community. Uh, we know how organizations uh, change. We, we've known, we have evidence of this over probably 500 years of knowledge. Uh, schools have never done it very well. And I, I think what we're doing is now seeing how we can move people to the other side of this bridge where I don't know what this new system of learning is going to look like, but there are more and more and more ways for people to see and engage with what this form of learning looks like, which then allows them to become change agent, change agents or willing changers within the school system. I love it. Eric. Yeah. First of all, thank you all. Like I'm already experiencing the play feeling of being more excited by what's happening. So yeah, jazz hands. Um, <laughs> So a couple quick thoughts that this makes me think of. One is um, when we think about the time in a school day, this is one of the lies that plagues our education system, right? The time to learn a specific skill is very different from the reason why they're in school as a custodial experience or the time we're doing X, Y, Z. So when you're thinking about the priorities of your school and how you wanna spend your time, whether it's in creative play or collaboration or deep research or investigation or anything, whatever. Like first let go of the lie, right? Your kids don't need to be sitting at a desk for eight hours a day. On the contrary, that's the worst thing for them. In the same way that our country needs to let go of the lie at the heart of who we are in order to heal ourselves and begin to deal with who we're gonna be. Well, the education system is the same thing. And so you look at the diversity of the education system and the breakdowns in it, how could you possibly expect any of us or anybody that this system would be solved when it's predicated upon a number of either, you can call them lies, you can call them false assumptions or errant assumptions or whatever. The compounding issue is that when they come together, it creates an unhealthy and un ineffective learning system. And that's what we have an opportunity to really play with now. I think you're right. And I think it's important that we understand that not every school needs to look alike. And I think that's been one of the problems that we've we come across. We find something that works for somebody, and then we think that is what we need to send to everybody. That's that it's going to work universally for everybody around the world, and that that's that's just not the way it goes. Now, what we want to encourage, what what I hope our conversations begin to encourage, is that school doesn't look the same everywhere. 
School doesn't need yeah. to be the same everywhere. And in fact, if we make, try to make it be the same everywhere, it's just as bad as saying that we need every child at age seven to be at this point on April 23rd. Yeah, and yeah. it just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense, but we don't hold ourselves to that standard. We want to homogenize, homogenize, homogenize. And yet, you know, Julie, what's interesting, when I've had the chance to, and I've asked this, I've gathered thousands of data points on this. When I ask community stakeholders of widely different types of school communities, very simple questions like, what do you want your, what, what would you like your school to look like? What's, a, what's one word you would like to use to describe your school? We get amazing convergence around, I want my school to be a place of engagement and community and love and passion and creativity, and all those words. You never get almost, in, almost nobody ever says, I want my school to be a place where my kid learns the quadratic formula, or gets a five on the AP test. Mm -hmm. Other than, and I think this holds for uh, schools other than a sc very underserved schools where the, the, the main goal would be, I want my kid to be safe and come home in the afternoon with their stomach full. I mean, I, and I don't have a solution for that. So I do think there are some quasi universal design principles that speak to what Eric was talking about is that the community itself knows that they don't want the traditional system. We just have to help them understand they don't know, that they don't want it. Uh, and that they want something different and then design around that. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, go ahead, Wendy. Oh, I just wanted to say that um, one of the things I love the most about teaching is that I get to be in this exciting space where I get to see what happens. And I'm with these learners that I know really well, and they need very different things from in between individuals and between groups and the way the dynamic forms. And so sometimes, you know, sometimes they want me to give them some high structure and sometimes they want me to throw the rules out and, and give them all the power. And we, we navigate that because I have academic freedom in higher ed. That, that is the essence of, of, I think, what's needed in the schools as we re-envision them is K through 12 teachers need academic freedom because they know their students. They know, so we need to train them really well and then let them decide what needs to happen on day-to-day -day basis. I think, I think it's more like improv where we actually have to really respond to, to what's happening. And, and it's ironic that, um, you know, in higher ed and in preschool, there's a lot of academic freedom with, with less training, but the K through 12 teachers who have such a, you know, prescribed teacher training, they don't get to do what they want to do. I don't, I don't think I would enjoy teaching if, if I didn't get to, to punt in the moment when something is needed. That's all of my plans always go out the window. The students always have better ideas or different ideas or it takes a different form. So, so um, speaking to Grant's point about how at each these schools are different, classrooms are different, individuals are different, learning you know, proclivities and, and personalities. And, and so I think freedom really is what's needed and more of a trust and a freedom for the individual teachers. I want to go to Jillian, but I just want to say, in addition to that, you know what, the reason you can do that is because you have relationship with those people. And there's no educator on earth that would disagree with the fact that in order to teach my students, I have to know them. I have to know them deeply. I have to know more about them. I have to, I have to, be, I, I have to be invested in, in, in learning who they are. Okay, Jillian, go. I just, I, I think that in my context here in British Columbia and Canada, um, we had teachers have a lot, maybe a lot more autonomy. I'm not, certainly not an expert on the American school system, but I believe there might be a little bit of less autonomy for this, for this teachers to, to do that different kind of engagement. So my two part answer, one is you might be interested in looking at the new curriculum in British Columbia, away with the content coverage. It is a competency focused curriculum. So rather than giving the, the humanities nine teacher 150 pages of content to cover, using the content that you choose and your students choose, develop communication competency, critical creative thinking competencies, and social and emotional learning and well-being. So within that space, educators have a lot of freedom to uh, unleash the potential of their students. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to say was, um, well, one particular piece I think is important um, to your point, Grant, in terms of organizational change. Yes, 
so many changes in education and so little change, absolutely. But we have all, I'm sure, read Michael Fullan's work. We have to go back to the educators. We need to hear their stories. And he talks about moral, age, moral purpose and, and change agentry or whatever. Basically, it's about allowing educators to tell you their stories, why they came, help them understand their own purposes in education so that we can better understand why educators are doing what they do and, and help them see the disconnect between what they wanna do and what the system is telling them to do. So empowering the educators is incredibly important for changing the system on a larger level. Um, am I saying it's simple? No. Am I saying it's a missed out piece that has to happen? Yes. Yes. Let me, let me respond to what Jillian just said. And by the way, I've heard such great things about the, the curriculum changes in, in British Columbia. And thank goodness, I wish the other provinces in Canada were, were following along. But we, we can say the same thing about the United States. I visited School A, that is a common core based public school with a certain set of standards. And it might be the most sort of soul crushing, rigid, uh, you know, I don't want to be teaching or learning here school. I can go to another school that is a common core standard school in a union district, in a public, in a public school setting, and they are crushing it. They, you, you would want to, you would love it if your kids went there. You would want to go back and go to school there yourself. And so we have examples, and this is what I've tried to do in the three books that I've written in the last five and a half years, is just let people know that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. All of these schools are already out there. They're doing the things that you say are difficult for your school to do, for you to do in your classroom. You just have to see how we have to create mechanisms for educators to see that it's already being done and it's okay and they don't have to reinvent that wheel. Uh, and we can't blame it, as Eric said, we can't continue to blame it on it's the, you know, it's the fault of the system or it's the fault of the curriculum. Or something. We actually do have more freedom here in the States than even in the public schools. If we choose to, if we choose to take advantage of it, some schools and districts do; others absolutely don't. Can I connect what I'm hearing on a few? Okay, so um, I think Wendy, you said something really important, which is like, from a professional de development standpoint, if we're training or teaching or empowering educators to know how to do things, so that then they can in turn be flexible. And if the underlying assumption that Julie stated is that there is a high level of trust and care and connection, then we can assume X, Y, Z. What I feel like is imperative in order for any school to succeed is that the, the leaders are learners. If they're not learners, this cannot go anywhere. If they're learners, everything that we're talking about can take root and the seeds can go. You're already jumping on it, Jillian. Where were you going? I just wanted to give you a thumbs up. <laughs> you keep going. You, you're, yeah. Oh. Well, no, you're, you're, you're right. I mean, I, I've been so fortunate to have conversations with a lot of great people, and I had a wonderful conversation with Deb Meyer, who talking about, you know, democratic schools and allowing the stakeholders, the teachers, actually, the freedom to kind of talk about what your school needs to be, and um, I. And I do think maybe where, where we're headed here is that well, we're recognizing what we want education to be and we can see what our mission is, but it's not being communicated in a way that people can hear it and trust in it. So it seems like everybody who's following this path um, or, or their own path toward this kind of education, and I want to say that clearly, their own path to this kind of education, is finding success and joy in the, in the journey, joy in the journey. But um, we're, we're not communicating it well enough so that other people are willing to take that risk. They feel that it's a risk. And so I'm wondering how we communicate this, how, how we communicate this with people. Um, Virtus Kara said in our, in, our, in our little conversation called Communicating the Mission, he said, you know, we have to, we have to, we have to look at the barriers that the, our audience is bringing and, and we have to think about who our audience is and we have to think about those barriers and then we have to find ways to help them understand what we're saying and we have to listen because their barriers may, may change what we think. 
So I'm just wondering, how do we get this out there? Who's not worked on this for us? Julie, one, communication is one of the critical steps, and, and I've published and, and republished. There's a there's something called the Stairway of Successful Innovation, and if you Google my last name and Stairway of Successful Innovation, you get a graphic, and it's based on graphics that go that were developed back in the '80s about how an organization changes. And Eric is right. The the number one point: if you don't have leadership that empowers change across the organization, it's not gonna happen. If you don't have leadership that models, that acts a role model, it's not gonna happen. Communication is one of those. What Wendy was talking about, we need, the, we need our teachers to have skill sets that allow them to teach in a different way. And most colleges of education are not like Wendy's. They're not preparing teachers with a skill set. So there are a number of different, there are eight or nine of these elements that, that are, are, are required, not just one. Um, and so, uh, the, the, the core of that argument is, is that schools are a system. You can't change one part of the system and think that everything else is, can just stay the same. Uh, we can have the best communication plan in the world if we don't have the skill set, if we don't have the resources, if we don't have the commitment, if we don't have sustainable leadership and that, that sort of thing. I will say with respect to communication, I believe, and I, these are out of this, a lot of this out of my book, Moving the Rock, the best way to communicate uh, to, to uh, families about what is possible with, or, and teachers is to show them. And whether that is screening most likely to succeed and having people go, oh, there's a school called High Tech High that's doing it, we can do that too. Or whether it's starting a pilot in a school, in a district so that families can say, wait, I want that kind of education rather than what my kids are going through. People, parents and teachers have to be able to see what it looks like and then they can get to the point where they go, oh, I can do that too, or I want that as well. And it starts to create a groundswell. I think groundswell is the right word there because I do think that this has to come from, from families. This has to come from the end user. This has to come from all of us who are learners. So I think that's, I think that's right. And then I think those pieces will follow. Um, I wanna shift a little bit and, um, I think we've talked a lot about, uh, you know, sort of things that, that we all agree are important and, and maybe some areas where certainly in the States here, um, I don't know, we've, we've, we've declined. Um, and I think part of that is, is, is in the arts. Uh, I think we've, I think we've been just really robbing the arts budget. And I think that everybody on this panel would agree that a life without the arts is unthinkable. I mean, um, a life without music or a, a life without visual art or a life without people who, who, can, who can, you know, bring ideas to the stage so that we can actually look at them in ways that are, are, are bearable for us, maybe our most painful things. Um, but I, I think that we've, we've, we've robbed those budgets so much that families are left to try and create the arts for their own children um, on their own, through their own you know, finances. Um, and I just feel like we're, we're leaving a whole generation um, without something that they need to have a joyful and rich life. And I'm just wondering what are some ways that we can, we can get we can get the word out on this so that families can work together on this important subject. I mean, there is no question that arts improve all outcomes. They don't just give you a joyful life. Um, if what you're interested in is higher test scores, the arts do that too. And so I, the, why are we the, still fighting this? Yes. This is one of those fascinating situations. Like obviously there's all of this dialogue that's surfaced in the last three, four years, let's say, in the states, given the administration's approach to science and data and alternative facts. But the value of arts education, that data has been ignored for decades. Decades. As if it, the studies mean nothing. Whether you're looking in communities um, where they're like, so I worked in Chicago for a long time, for 20 some years. And um, I worked, I was very lucky, like, as you said, Grant, I was able to work with people all across the spectrum, public charter, private, rich, poor, black, white, Latino, Asian, everything. And um, what we found to be true is that in every single environment, people need a way to express their voice and to connect across the barriers. 
And arts and play are those two ways to do that. And it was through that experience that we were able to build, like our kids would say, the best thing about this experience is the diversity of it. Whether that diversity was real or perceived, whether it was ideological or racial or age or whatever it was, what they started to realize was that something different was happening here and something was coming out and they were hearing or feeling new voices. One of the first programs I did was called Camp of Dreams. And we took 26 kids from urban Chicago who had never been out of the city into the woods for three weeks. And they learned how to like build, build fires and live in camps. And we had this super enrichment program and we had philosophy and we were doing everything. And uh, they did, you know, they brought to your points, like what programs did they want to bring? One of the great programs that was brought was a step program, step dance. I had never stepped. I didn't know what step was before my 25th birthday. Well, step can united us with a beat to our soul that I didn't even know connected us. And like, it didn't matter who you were. You see the kids get up and they're starting to move and you're moving. You see them smiling, you feel their energy and you are more energized. So to your point and to like come back to this, when we built a school and we were thinking about how do we do this? Our answer was embed, embed everything. STEAM versus STEM renaissance versus single subject and um, cultural exposure. You want to study something, hear it, taste it, smell it, embed as uh, robust and diverse an experience about that thing as possible. Beautiful. Uh, yes, Jillian. And then I, I actually have a question from Facebook. So go ahead, Jillian. Sure. I just very quickly, Eric, totally agree with you in terms of that embeddedness. I think the arts faces a similar misunderstanding like imagination. People think we can get on in life without it, but because they associate the arts with sort of mostly other people. I'm not an artist. I'm not a dancer. I'm not this. We're musical animals. The way we walk, the way we run, the way we play. So we're all inherently artistic. And it's really, I wish we could talk more about artistry because ultimately we're really diminishing our chances of having creativity and innovation if we leave out the arts. And if you wanna look at Ruth Bernstein's work around the connection between imagination and, and an old book, Sparks of Genius, around reimagining schooling, it has to do with embedding the arts because there's such a direct correlation between in, enabling our ability to envision the possible and ultimately creativity and innovation. So yeah. just that. We talk about the arts here at Slate School because we say that, you know, um, some, some uh, ideas can only be expressed in certain ways. So you can't, ex there are some things that can only be expressed in a, a visual painting. And so music, all those. You go, Jillian. It's so. just, I'm sorry, it's a, it is a massive social justice issue here because if we're eliminating the arts from schools and we're relying on uh, extracurricular activities to do that, we're increasing the stratification, we're lowering chances of success in, in so many ways. Um, so yeah, it, it's a matter of justice ultimately and it, it's, it's part of the big problem we're facing overall. Absolutely. But that's a, that's a big can, worms, open <laughs> worms. Yep. There it goes. Oh, there it goes. Sorry, I just wanted to chime in for one quick yes. second and just say that, that this is really at the basis of my passion of bringing the science to, to the ground. And, that, and that's also a social justice issue. There's an elitism to our institutions where we, the, the research stays with the researchers and gets published in journals that only the researchers read. And I feel that, that really the, the kids who could benefit from the science of child development are not benefiting from the science. Yes. We need to get the data to the people. There needs to be curation. There needs to be translation. It's a different language. We need to, to translate that work and get it on the ground to future teachers, to parents, to caregivers, to people making decisions. Because like you said, Julie and Eric, there's a mountain of evidence for the arts and learning. And so where's the disconnect where, you know, the decisions that are being made are not, are not being made based on the developmental science evidence. What you're talking about, what you all, kind of all three just looped around uh, is I, I can't help but hear this fundamental issue of access and trust reemerging in here. So what do we make available to kids in school and at home? So when we built our school, we obviously had a, you know, a design lab in there, but we actually left all of our tools danger tools accessible to the kids. My kids, I mean, I have a 22 year old who's an older kid, but I have a seven year old and twin four year olds. 
those kids have access. My house is constantly a mess. That's the downside. The upside is they have all of the craft material, including things with which they can hurt themselves, available to them. Scissors, glue, markers, pen, dirt, rocks, you know, wood, whatever. The reason we, you know, instruments, they're just there because, and their bikes are there. The reason is like, if we don't make those things as ubiquitous as balls and a computer, then we are telling them we don't value those things. We're actually undervaluing the creative mindset or the artistic mindset. And we're engendering that self-bias from the beginning. So I, I'm with you on all these things that are, are, we're talking about. We, we, we definitely show our preferencing and, and have to be careful about that. So I have to also think, I, go ahead. I also think we, we keep fighting in education. We're always fighting the last battle. And so for the last two decades, uh, we've been heavily invested in STEM for a very good reason. Look, the fact of the matter is there's a heck of a lot more jobs out there in STEM fields than there are in arts and humanities fields. So somebody says we've got to overweight to STEM. If you look at the work, for example, of uh, Gerd Lenhard, who is you know, looking 20 years into the future, the, the, the jobs that are going to be available for kids that are solely focused on STEM-like programming are the ones that are gonna disappear most quickly with the rise of AI. So what are the characteristics that somebody like Lenhard says that we really need to be balancing against STEM? Creativity, compassion, originality, reciprocity, responsibility, and empathy. Those are the things that come out of the humanities and the arts field. If people think of arts as, I'm gonna learn how to paint a painting, we as educators have utterly failed in the conversation rather than leading it towards what are the human characteristics that are gonna be valued in the future and we have to balance those against just the job related uh, uh, areas of STEM which could likely disappear with the rise of things like uh, technology, uh, uh, art, uh, artificial intelligence. Yes, yes. Okay, so I have a question from Facebook here. How do we get school administrators on board to reimagine education? Yikes, that's a big one. How do we get administrators on board? What, what, what do you think? Um, at the beginning of this pandemic, I had a bit of a writer's block. Um, I've, I was trying to put out some articles and, and the only thing I could write about was how it's ludicrous to suddenly ask everybody reimagine schools when up until now we've completely sidelined and ignored imagination and we're expecting everybody to be able to radically do this. And so it was a bit of a rant and we'll see if it gets published in a journal I've put it out in. Um, but that we need, we need to understand more how leaders understand imagination. Because I said, like I said, we always rush to the creativity and innovation piece, but we need to democratize the ability to more readily, more flexibly, more fluidly, empower people ourselves as leaders and also learn to grow the imaginations of our teachers who then like it's a trickle down into schools so i think we need to understand it more this is one of one of this is my research platform starting in in the fall is around the role of imagination and leadership so i'd love to talk to others who are interested in in ex explaining you know how they see imagine work imagination working not because i want to leave the conversation here but i believe there are very practical strategies we can then embed in our professional development of leaders and in our pre-service education of leaders so that we can begin to to give more attention to imagination and leadership so the quick answer is there's no quick fix to this because right now there's probably leaders we know many that are fantastic but imagination and imaginative leadership should not be the capacity of the few it should be the capacity of the many so that was a really Jillian, unfulfilling I, answer probably i liked it i liked Jillian. it what I've found is, is, is more like what Wendy was saying. I don't actually believe that it is, that, that, uh, it is a question of whether the leaders have or need to develop imagination. I think we know how organizations change. The problem is that that knowledge base has never been translated well for educators. Schools are different places than pg e or Apple or someplace like that. We have special considerations and the DNA of the people within schools is different than it is in other organizations. What I've found is, is that with some fairly simple translations of this is how imagination takes place. This is how you can get your faculty, how you can get your community to imagine and aspire differently than they have in the past, that 
not all, but many school administrators are able to make that transformation. They've just never learned it. They went to ed school. They, they were English teachers, and then they became a vice principal, and then they became a principal. They never learned this skill set. There are some who will not learn it. There are some who will resist. And we're in a period of evolution, and during times of evolution, some individuals and species don't make it through the evolutionary curve. That's a fundamental principle of, of life. But Many, many educators I've found can make it through if we just translate for them, how does this look in a school? So we have another Facebook question and it's about um, risk. Can I, answer, can I answer that one too? Yeah, hit it, hit it. Okay, I've, I've trained over 100 educators in over 150 districts in the last five years. So I've been all over the country doing a lot of training. And I would say there's a couple of things that I see. Um, the first one is that within three minutes, I can establish trust in a room of educators I don't know. Mm -hmm. They may never have trusted each other except in pockets and clicks until then, which means if there's a click, there's not trust in the community. And what I find almost always is this is fear. A couple of different types of fear. Fear about performance appraisal, which is tied to something that does, is not consistent with the path of education that even if the district is talking about it or the school is talking about it. So let's say they want to shift toward PBL or competency-based learning or self-directed or student-directed, whatever, but yet the performance appraisal is still inconsistent. So then you have a fear where literally the teacher will say, well, why would I do that if I'm being evaluated this way? The second is this larger parent-driven fear or anxiety, which is, will my kid fill in the blank? Go to college, be able to get a job, whatever. And so education serves as this false or this fraudulent band-aid where it's somehow the school is intending to solve that problem and now you're actually undermining your intention on communication which we were talking about 20 minutes ago so why are we here what are we doing well right let's be where we are bring out those anxieties share those fears let's have an open dialogue we're not a one-stop shop right we want to understand so that we can serve with integrity and the areas where we're not as strong, we want to make sure that we have connections to round that out. So those are some things that I see. And then the last one on that is focus on process, not product. If your end goal is the thing you're focused on, like we want 82% of our kids going to Ivy League schools, or we want 100% of our kids going to college, you've already looked past who your community really is. So focus on the process as opposed to the product, and you'll be much more able to facilitate and manage complicated conversations that draw out discourse and differences and imagination and creativity and anxieties, et cetera. And create partnerships, yeah. right? So, so families do fill in for where the school cannot serve and schools fill in for where the family cannot serve and everybody is working together for a common goal for that community. Um, so I have another question. The process is the product. Yeah. I mean, but we've done a terrible job of demonstrating the value of that. A terrible job of demonstrating the value of that. So here, I've got a question here. How do people get to understand the value? How do we get people to understand the value of risk taking? People tend to be so afraid to be wrong or to fail, and it prohibits them from even trying. We celebrate risk. And it has to start with the titular leaders. This is one of the things, because we have the ability now to, uh, we have the ability and in fact the imperative to not have these vertically hierarchical systems that because they just don't work in times of rapid change. And that's what we've seen in the last 12 weeks. But one of the things that the titular leaders have to do is they have to model risk taking. If the superintendent if the, if, the, if, the, if the board doesn't hire a superintendent that's willing to take risks and the superintendent isn't willing to take risk visibly, the, the site leaders aren't going to write on down all the way down to the students. And so the schools that I see that are really crushing it are places where they really celebrate risk taking. They talk about what risk taking is, what appropriate risks are, the sort of things that Wendy probably teaches her students that are not taught at most uh, schools of education around the country uh, uh, it, it, because, because Eric is exactly right. The two biggest uh, uh, impediments to change are fear and inertia. You can't change without taking a risk and yet schools are been designed around 
not letting people take risks. And where we see that breakdown, we start to see the needle chain uh, move very, very quickly. And it has to start with the leaders very visibly modeling, risk taking, celebrating and rewarding and expecting uh, others to take a risk within the system. I mean, the truth is we can't grow unless we're willing to change. Yeah. And we don't stay the same when we grow. Yeah. We have to be willing to change and, and resistance to change is huge. I see you, Wendy, yes. That also speaks to this idea that the, the process is the product. So if we're focused on process, there is no, there is no mistake, there is no loss. It's not, it's not risky because we don't have an outcome in mind. So if we get away from the idea that we need deliverables and this kind of um, factory or corporate model of education that we want outcome, 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 the, if the process is what we value, then there's not, you have nothing to lose by, by doing something differently, by coming out a different end. And I think our assessment has to go with that. But the whole culture, you know, the parents have to feel, as you said before, Julie and Eric, the parents are learners too. The teachers are learners too. So we're, we have a whole culture. We're in this together. We're, we're not, at the end, you don't come away with a physical product. At the end, you come away with, with an experience and you become someone who loves to learn and you become someone who's, who's open. Who, so risk taking is part of that, I would say. We need to sort of overhaul the idea of, of these measurable outcomes and, and get into the idea that I'm gonna, I'm gonna produce students that love to learn. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna produce teachers that love to learn too. And we're gonna teach and learn each other. And the, guess what? The parents in this community are gonna be fascinated and love to get involved too and be part of this, this kind of unknown process we have to be okay with that that unknown it's i think it's a big shift in our culture wendy i'm i'm with you you know people say that like um when you think about like the two the how the crisis in 2008 right a totally different type of crisis well we saw there was a failure in our mental models so if you use that as one tiny example of all how all of our cognitive biases at play people don't take risks because they think their prevailing model is right well right now all bets are off. Your models are failing anyways. So like now's a really good time to take the risk because your status quo won't work anyways. And if you're waiting for things to get back to normal, you're not taking any risk, you're already failing. So like, look around. Risk is a great way to just take a different, like if you need help taking risks again, and like, how do I, how do you break it down and keep it simple? Travel a different path to and from the place you're going. Try and eat different foods ask questions, you know, ask people things you don't know. Um, try to do, try to solve any problem differently. Use a different hand to do something you need to do. Like, keep it simple. Bring risk taking back to the basics of everyday life. And then people will discover the benefits and opportunities that come from basic risk taking. Risk taking is a mindset. It's like everything else. It's, a, it's about being careful and cautious in the type of risks you take. I'm not going to risk take walking out of the third floor window right now, but I'll risk take these other things. And so how do we balance that? Well, it's a mindset. So how do we cultivate a risk taking mindset is really the deeper question that I'm, I would be encouraging in communities. And I think one other thing, there, there are people in the world that say, I don't have the luxury of taking a risk. That's what I'm saying. You're already failing. Like, I agree. It's not a question of luxury. Right now, the world is telling us our mental models are failing. We need you to take risks. I used to say to my, my team, I'd say, you can never tell me anything wrong. You can hold something back. The worst thing you could, like culture of silence, whether you're trying to, you know, violence or integrity or, you know, you're trying to build a, a, co a, you know, a cohesive unit. We need to know. It's the lack of those things which really undoes us. Yeah, but Julie, but Julie, I think we have to definitely be sensitive to what you just said, and, and, and I don't have the answer to this at all, as I, as I said earlier. There are communities in our country and around the world where our perception of taking a risk is a luxury that they can't afford. And uh, until those problems are solved, those communities have a really different relationship with risk taking than, than I do and with, with my kids and a lot, a lot of the schools that I work with. So um, we have to be careful with that. There are equity issues there that uh, hopefully we're having a new conversation about. Uh, I certainly don't even begin to have answers uh, to those uh, 
so we have to always have that strong caveat in, in our mind when, when the risk uh, of getting out of bed in the morning and walking to school is, is one that is the biggest is, is, a, is present in your mind all the time, then some of the more academic things that we're talking about are rather meaningless. But in the end, they'll save us. We can have schools that educate us all. This mm -hmm. is what we need. Um, all right. So final thoughts today for, um, for going forward. I love how we ignored many of the questions that I had written. That makes it so much better. I love you people so much. Thank you so much for increasing my brain and, and really pushing this conversation. Final thoughts from the panel. Anything that you'd like to say to all the folks that are, that are with us here today listening and all those that will, will listen later today? For me, it's just to keep talking, keep playing, put, keep questioning. We want our students, um, as Linda Kaiser, uh, a fantastic educator here in BC says, we want them to come out of school more curious than they were when they started. So we need to, it's worth working towards that goal. Yep. I also think of the, uh, this wonderful quote by Alfie Cohn that says, the best predictor of academic excellence is the level of student excitement and joy. And I think that that's also the best predictor of academic excellence um, for teacher learners too, is, is academic, is um, excitement and joy that we, that we need to be free to feel that authentic curiosity and excitement ourselves as, as educators. Yeah. One, of the, one of the big takeaways that I'm hearing from educators uh, based on the last 12 weeks is that we have always said that the physical, social, emotional well-being of our students and, frankly, are the adults in the system are job number one. We've never lived that at all in our schools. It's, ne it's never been job one, even though we, we, we've sort of said that it is. Uh, I think more people believe now that that is the case and that focusing on well-being is not in conflict with or antithetical to academic excellence. It, in fact, amplifies academic excellence. If there's an outcome of this that I hope we're learning uh, uh, around, uh, there's the equity issue and the well-being issue, I think it is that we need to do these together. This is the yes and of all time. Uh, if we don't get it right, we've just wasted a, we've wasted a great crisis. Yeah. Yeah. Eric, anything from you? All right, um, this concludes the time we have for the panel today and as we might have thank you. The conversation is anything but over, right? Uh, we will convene additional panels to contemplate this idea throughout the summer, which I hope will lead us to clarity and consensus maybe and wisdom, real wisdom. Thank you for the opportunity, Julie. I appreciate it very much. Oh, are you kidding? Thank you so much. I'm so grateful that you were all here. Um, thank you to these panelists. You're amazing. Thank you to all that we, everybody was watching and thank you for your questions. Um, the school year is over here at Slate School, but since school is wherever you are, I will still offer positive rice to all as a conclusion to this, to this panel. And thank you again for joining us. Positive rice. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.